we're actually are live right now and until it indicates that we're live I'll, I'll for sure let you know but i will have to uh click out of this thing so it won't echo and we are we are we are live now mm-hmm. let me click out of this and i'm also gonna cut it on here let me find you on the screen there we go. Um, I'm going to find where we are just in case we have questions popping up then I can ask. In the past, I wasn't so good at asking uh, questions, but now we got this. Now I'll mute that. Okay. Now, anyway, so we have I, I, I'm Gisli. Is it Gisli or Gisli Paulson? And I know in Icelandic, it sounds totally different. No, Gisli is fine. Gisli? Okay. So we got Gisli Paulson in the building. Uh, he's a professor of anthropology uh, at University of Iceland, uh, author, editor, and co-editor of many books, uh, in particularly this book right here, The Man Who Stole Himself, The Slave Odyssey of Hans Jonathan, is what I'm mainly interested in. Um, I've found out about it when I believe when it was around the time it was published in Icelandic in 2014 Mm -hmm. and uh, I moved to Norway in 2012 and I found out about it around that time 2014 I was like man I was like I can't I can't read I can't read Icelandic I wish I can I can read it and then I when I got word that it was going to be translated into English in 2016 I, I just couldn't wait to get get my hands on it and and start reading it I thought it was like uh, just when I was reading some of the uh, excerpts or or that was translated into English or things that was a little bit written about it that I can find around it earlier when it first got published in English, uh, I, I thought it was just going to be a, a, a great story. I mean, I think that you can this could be a movie, I think, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm and I always and I wonder if somebody came to you about that. I, I was always wondering about that. And I don't know if in those things you probably can't talk about always. But not anyway. Much, not much, but there is a project going on. Right, right. Because I was like, this thing could be a movie. But anyway, you, he's, 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 you, you've done works for us. You, you're like a geo, uh, a political ecology. He's into p- political ecology, environmental anthropologist. Mm-hmm. And so most of your work has been done doing like geopolitics geo sociality as you call it mm-hmm. um about the anthropocene mm-hmm. could you could you uh describe what that is is that is that about basically about the human impact on on the earth in things like that yeah okay and so that was your that has been your kind of main study or whatnot yeah before so, you got into writing the book yeah um Throughout my career, I mean, I, I finished my doctoral uh, job in, in uh, 1982. Okay. And I soon got a job at, at the University of Iceland. And, and throughout my PhD work and, and uh, later, I've been uh, uh, passionate about uh, human interests, uh, humanitarian concerns in a broad uh, sense. And that includes uh, our concerns with the planet and the future of the, the uh, life world and under the Anthropocene, under threats of climate change, etc., And of course, uh, enslavement and the history of Hans Jonathan, the first black to settle to settle in Iceland. In Iceland. And then you, you, you did your dissertation, if I, if I heard correctly, in, uh, up on, on slavery or racism? Racism, I think, right? No, my PhD was on fisheries, on Icelandic fisheries. Okay, and I thought I heard somewhere that you had mentioned that you did a dissertation on racism when, uh, on the, during the, the um, dang, what was it called? The Einstein Forum? or. Yeah. I thought I yeah. heard. That's that. a good point. And it's only occurred to me years after I wrote the book about Hans Jonathan that I did actually write my BA dissertation. Oh, okay. Got you. My stand on, uh, on racism. So okay. somehow the issue was there, although I didn't quite connect it. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, because that was my my question. My my first main question was, what got you into yeah wanting to write this story? Um, but it seems like you were always kind of thinking about the human condition and, and our impact in the world, as 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 you just said. Um, and I also read in the prologue in the in the book where it also talks about how you watched a Danish TV documentary, correct? Mm -hmm. Called Descendants of Slaves. Yeah. And 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 things like that. So yeah. what, what what was that what gave you kind of the the spark to yes. go ahead and write about uh about him, Hans Jonathan? Yeah, so uh I think I got concerned with uh, racism um uh, and the issue of blackness uh, etc. Uh, during my BA work. Um I mean I was just 20 years old and, right. and uh, anthropology got me into this domain and, and, and I was part of the so-called 68 movement in, in Iceland. I mean, uh, kids were looking for alternative avenues, other ways of running society. And, right. Kind of like a hip, the hippie movement, huh? Yeah. <laughs> also, at least in Europe, quite, quite radical, looking R for... Right for new ways of organizing society. And, right. and I guess that got me into writing the BA dissertation. And so somehow I had uh, the interest early yeah, on. Yeah, you had the interest early on, yeah. But, but it was triggered off by, uh, by uh, attending, uh, watching TV in Copenhagen. <laughs> Just out of the blue, I saw a Danish program on uh, Icelandic descendants of uh, an enslaved person who had settled in, in East Iceland. And, uh, before you before you watched that documentary, did you know anything about uh, Hans Jonathan? No, no, I didn't know the name. I didn't know anything about the saga. Wow. And the uh, amazing thing was that I recognized some of the people interviewed in the uh, on the TV screen. Okay. The papers in the Westman Isles where I grew up south of Iceland in a small uh, 5,000 people community and, right. and, and I was stunned to see that my neighbors descended from a, a black guy who was a descendant wow. of, from West Africa and just it blew my mind the, uh, the, the connections and, and I felt uh, immediately an urge to track down the story uh, I didn't have a sense of a book at that point, but but I was so curious, and and I think uh, about a couple of weeks later, I, I returned to Iceland from Copenhagen. I had spent a month there, mm. and one of the first things uh, I did was to call one of the Icelanders interviewed and uh, ask for a meeting, and and uh, and. Uh, we had a good chat and he showed me some uh, amazing papers from the archives in Copenhagen. And uh, so he was a descendant of, of uh, Hans Jonathan. And so gradually I began uh, looking around and, and uh, establishing a kind of crowdsourcing network. I mean, friends in the US and, and Copenhagen and, and Iceland who uh, had some knowledge of the archives and, and the saga. And, uh, and uh, uh, within months, I got uh, a transcript from Copenhagen of the critical uh, core documents. Okay. Which uh, outlined the proceedings and, and why and how Hans of the wid Of the widow. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Why he was sentenced to. Sentence is not the right word, but the, the court concluded he, he was a slave and he right. was the property of, of, of the widow. And once I had these documents, which are unique and historic in, in Danish leak of history and possibly history of enslavement, I felt I have some stuff possibly for, for a full-blown biography and and I, I had students uh, scanning the archives and, and colleagues and friends, parts of my network. Uh, it was uh, definitely a team effort. <laughs> so yeah. There was a lot of, uh, lot of good research you'd done. 
for this? Yeah, it was, uh, it was heavily a, a, a team effort. And, and uh, some days I would just sit at my computer and wait for emails from uh, mm -hmm. St. Croix or Philadelphia yeah. or Copenhagen or Eastern Iceland. <laughs> I mean, from archives or and I was kind of a secretary taking, right. taking notes. And, no, that's a that's a difficult task to trace back, especially when it comes to records when it dealt with slaves and stuff. I mean, even my I myself trying to trace my own history is, is, is pretty difficult, at least on my father's side. Yeah. Especially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I only imagine of yeah. tracing that story there. Yeah. But, um and uh, mm -hmm. but, but I managed to uh, to have some funds from my university, basically, and, and so I could hire students and assistants, and right. I could uh, fly to uh, New York and Philadelphia and, and St. Croix and Copenhagen to, mm. to, to explore some of the critical sites and, and to interview people and, and to go to the archives. So uh, over a few years, I was assembling stuff and, and, and I began writing seriously. Right. Now, speaking of that, I'm going to even take some of the themes that you already put on uh, yourself on uh, the Einstein uh, forum uh, with the who deserves a biography, yeah. <laughs> which is good. Uh, and you and you go into it. You, you had. Um, yeah. Talked about how there were so few biographies um, even back then uh, yeah. written yeah. and they were kind of saved for uh, wealthy white people, of course. And so to put this biography together, um, well, you you did you you drew some information from a biography, correct? But uh, of of a um, what was it? One of the Schimmelmans, correct? They had like a little biography of yes. right. And so, but they didn't talk so much about Hans. Jan they only no. they haven't really mentioned Hans Jonathan in, in that. No, that, that's interesting. That's a book about 500 pages about the history of the Schimmelmann family. In German, correct? In German, and right. it's only mentioned uh, a couple of places, mentions Hans Jonathan only in a couple of places, and, okay. and it's really minor. I had a German-speaking uh, assistant from Austria who thoroughly read the Schimmelmann book mm. and, and told me mm. what I could sort of digest and pick out from it, and but, so you had yeah. you had a really play investigator then, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. There was some, there was so many uh, blind spots in the saga. I mean, I had uh, first I had some uh, census documents from East Iceland from 1815 or so. Got you. And uh, and uh, and I had the court documents from 1801 from Denmark. Right. And uh, so. Um, I had no idea for a couple of years uh, when Hans Jonathan exactly came to Iceland. Mm. And there were some rumors he had been in Hamburg or someplace in between, between the jail and, and between and, and showing up in Eastern Iceland. Right. But friends pointed me out, to source, pointed out sources which, show, which showed that he had to have arrived here pretty soon after the verdict in Copenhagen in 1802. Right. Taking one of the last ships before the uh, shipping uh, line would close during the winter, typically in those days. So uh, this was just one of the important uh, blind spots which, which uh, were re revealed to me sort of uh, through the network, as I call right. it. Now why, why the, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to show the book once more for the audience um, who's looking. The Man Who Stole Himself. This is the English one that was uh, published in 2016. Um, yeah, The Man Who Stole Himself. I was going to ask you the title. Why, why the title of yeah. Stole, Stole Himself? Yeah, that's a good question. Or um, stealing of one stealing oneself. I know what yeah. you mean, but for, yeah. yeah. And, and it was quite interesting in, in retrospect. I, I was playing with simply a straightforward title, the biography of Hans Jonathan. Right. And somehow I felt it would be too flat and, and endless biographies of. Right. And, and, and uh, it was a good title, though. I, 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 it, it caught my attention for sure. 
Yeah, people uh, like it, and and I immediately liked it when they had found it. <laughs> uh, but uh, in a sense, it's stolen, mm. <laughs> like mm. the, the person himself. What happened was that uh, I was uh, getting tired and frustrated at work one day, and and uh, I was returning home, and I said to myself, "You you must find a good title for the book, for the manuscript." And it must be in the court documents from Copenhagen. That mm. is the drama of mm. the saga. Mm. And uh, I dived into the cellar of my home, which was my kind of uh, office when I was dealing with Hans Jonathan issues, mm -hmm. and, and, <laughs> uh, and uh, plowed through the court documents. Um, and I happened to notice a statement made by Hans. Uh, Jonathan's defense lawyer, and he said, ironically, in the, during the proceedings, if Hans Jonathan was the property of Frau Schimmelmann, uh -huh. and he had left the premises without her permission, uh -huh. he had stole himself. So that was oh, his, the, the, okay. his defense lawyer made that point. Right, that right. Issue, and I immediately thought, here you go. You wow. have a look. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. And otherwise, I think uh, his defense lawyer was sloppy. Um, uh, mm. I think he was kind of careless and, and, and uh, he could have done a much, much better job. But he probably knew, as most other people, that the results were given in advance because of the power of the sugar barons in Copenhagen. Right. Kind of like in today's modern times, it's what they call systemic uh, racism, white supremacy yeah. in, in, in certain yeah, exactly. certain, sen certain sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you, um, well, let's get into it briefly uh, about Hans Jonathan. So he, he was born into slavery in St. Croix. Uh, we won't, we'll, like I said, we have a short time today, so we're not going to, we encourage you to go purchase and buy the book. So we'll just get, briefly into what or, or who Hans Jonathan was. So he was a mulatto mixed biracial kid, as they call it today. Um, he was uh, born into slavery, St. Croix. Um, he, um, we know about his mother. Mm -hmm. That was Amelia Regina. Regina. And she was from Africa, well, she was born. She was born in Saint Croix, or, or herself, or was, that's not sure. Well, but I know her roots or origins from Africa. It's not sure, but she shows up in in, uh, in the records of Saint Croix in the Danish Virgin Islands quite young on right. the plantation La Rhine. Right, and uh, I suspect she uh, was born in Saint Croix, but her parents are almost bound to be both black from West Africa. From West Africa. Don't know exactly where. Right, right. And we'll get into it at the end because the project that you uh, talked about when it comes to the genetics or, or people that you know that reconstructed, I would like to get yeah. into that real brief. But so we start there in the, the, the island of St. Croix. So they, in that, in that well, you, you broke it down in like different chapters and also like subtopics or whatnot. Uh, in your book, uh, so the island of Saint starts out island Saint Croix, and you get into the a, a house Negro, and in there you talk about the horrible experiences of slavery, mm -hmm. and and the and the mother Amelia uh, Regina, and you talk about Christians Christ, uh, Christiansborg, uh, which was built by the Swedes later on, taken over by the Danes, and where kind of the most of the majority of the slaves, which is located around Osu Castle in, in current day Ghana. Mm -hmm. That's where majority of the slaves and most likely that's where she probably or her parents would have yeah. came from. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the. Um, uh, and then you get into Mulatto with Hans Jonathan and his in his life and on the plantation. For the, for the most part, and you said the first six or seven years he was on the um, plantation, plantation uh, constitution, correct? 
Yeah, Constitution Hill. Yeah. Right, in 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 uh, Saint Saint Croix, and you get into kind of kind of that. You you visited there, correct? Yeah, twice. Twice. Okay, and then also not too long ago, the um, the descendants of uh, Hans Jonathan in in Iceland and America visited there, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Were you with him at that time, or? Yes, I oh, okay. organized the trip. You organized the trip. Wow. Mm -hmm. About how many, how many descendants? Uh... Uh, there were about twenty of us. Okay. Maybe... How many are they in total? Uh, in that you trip. know of? No, not the trip, but I mean, in uh, in total. The descendants are about one thousand. Okay. And the genealogy is on the web, so they're all listed. Okay. Website. I, I don't know why I, I've heard, uh, I don't know if it was a rumor or somebody had said something where I was re researching this, um, where they said that Hans Jonathan was linked to one of the prime ministers. Is there, there was no truth to that, correct? No, there's, there's a rumor. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. There is a rumor and, and people see some physical likeness. But uh, I'm told there is no genetic connection, apart from we're all from East Africa. Right. Right, right. I like how you said that, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so is said now the father, we know the mother and the father who were, who's the mystery. And the mm -hmm. said to be in that subsection of the book called said to be the, sec the, the secretary, yeah. the possible father, the mysterious Mr. Graham, mm -hmm. otherwise known as Hans Graham. And, Hans Graham, and you are saying that is, in your opinion, are you still holding to that opinion that he most likely would be the father? The yes, uh, there's no proof yet. Right. But I think it's the most likely candidate, and, and the descendants themselves themselves have been playing with two hypotheses, uh, two Danish names. Uh, Molke and Schimmelmann. And Molke was one of the most powerful people in Denmark at the time. Um, and I could uh, quickly erase that name from the board mm, okay. uh, because uh, Danish historians convinced me that no Molke had been at the time in, in St. Croix. But Schimmelmann was more complex. And, but in the beginning, I, I, I imagine I would write the biography simply stating the two hypotheses, Moltke and Schimmelmann as, as, as the father, and uh, leaving it to others to, to judge. And, right. And, uh, now, speaking of the, 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 speaking of the Schimmelmans, I know we're kind of going over the place because I'm looking at the time and I'm also trying to look at the question because I know you got to go real soon. But yeah. the, the, the Schimmelmans, they were the ones who took, well, I don't want to say took him in, but enslaved him or also in, was uh, owners of his mother as well yeah correct and he was the governor of St. Croix at the time and yeah. they eventually went to Denmark and he went there when he was fairly young around what time was he around 10 9 no four or five. Oh, four or five okay okay and uh, yeah actually first uh, his mother was the property of, uh, of uh, the wife of the Schimmelmann. Right. And, and, uh, There's so many names in the Schimmelmans. I don't, I, uh, that's what I always say, that's why I always say the Schimmel, you know, it's yeah. a Schimmelman. Yeah. It's a but, she was, but she was enslaved by a Schimmelman. That's what, that was my point. Um, the mother. mother, mother was, his mother was explained by another set. I mean, Frau Schimmelmann, who became Frau Schimmelmann, she, gotcha. uh, her husband died and a Schimmelmann married. So uh, Emilia Regina, Hans Jonathan's mother, and Hans Jonathan became the property uh, practically of a Schimmelmann. And, and he was a plantation owner with his wife and, and later a, a governor of the Danish in West Indies. Right. And then also they were linked to, well, there was a Schimmelman that was a foreign secretary, right? Or something like that. Yeah, one of the Schimmelmans was a uh, minister of finance, which uh, okay. uh, started the war with the Battle of Copenhagen with Britain. So, right. so these were powerful guys and rich uh, sugar barons and right. in politics and, and in production. Right. And, and uh, 
And I like how you said in one uh, interview how how that's linked with Copenhagen to a lot of the the riches and, and things that we see in Copenhagen today. It kind of it uh, the sugar factory had a lot to do with the sugar plantation had a lot to do with the the wealth that we see in uh in the in the the building of Copenhagen. Yes, yeah. this... central Copenhagen is is right. beautiful and and right. fancy architecture and and, and rich. And uh, this couldn't have happened without the colonies, although the Danes uh, have generally forgotten this. Right. Have you been to the the mansion uh, that was that's in Copenhagen that you said it's in uh, Frederiksstaden district? You vis- I, I take it you definitely visited that. Yes. I, yes, I went to the the Schimmelman mansion. Right. Uh, now- it's a fancy. It, it is a fancy building. It's. Hmm. Now known now owned by uh, a private organization. Okay. Well, I want to get back to that plantation in uh, Saint Croix. You said that they were owned by two Americans. Yeah. I would take it white Americans, of course. Yes. Right. And they they definitely are aware of what they have. I'm sure now at this point in time. Were they were they aware of? I'm. I wonder if they were aware of the history behind that plantation before they purchased it and things like that through conversations i think they definitely were not aware of it but uh, okay i got in touch with them and and we exchanged email and they were extremely interested here in the saga and invited us to come and they held a party for us when we visited for 20 or or Mm. 30 people with some people from uh, african-american leaders on from saint croix uh, among them, so it was quite quite a gathering, and 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 they well, allowed not, us to to uh, take. Well, not, well, not only um, well, maybe they would not have known about the the Hans Jonathan connection there, but they you are you, you believe that they don't even know that that was like a plantation for slaves at that place. Uh, so the descendants, or no, no, I mean not the descendants, the uh, the owners. The, the American yeah. owners of oh, sure. PlayStation Constitution. Yeah. I, 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 I was, no, I was just asking if, if, did they, if you had got um, any word from them, speaking to them, if they, I'm, I'm sure they probably didn't know it was uh, where Hans Jonathan spent his years or probably didn't even know about him. But I'm mm-hmm. saying, I'm sure they, they, they would have known that it was, a, was used as a plantation. Yeah, or, yeah. Like, everyone uh, in St. Croix is aware Saint of, of where that, right. History and, Right, right, right. Enslavement, etc. But uh, right. generally, the name Hans Jonathan is not right in, in uh, right. around. Right, right. After my book. There you go. Yeah, no, it, you know, it's funny. Before I moved to Norway, um, when I was, I have a friend in Florida. I was living in Florida at the time, and uh, I have a friend from St. Thomas. And I, I remember I was looking, I was just looking at different properties and places in St. Croix and St. Thomas and things like that. And I remember seeing some Danish or Norwegian or Scandinavian names there. And I, and I didn't, at the time, I was like, what, what is that connection? Mm-hmm. Until later, I did more reading. And definitely, this is one of the books that, that, that opened, uh, opened my eyes to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so he um, in Copenhagen. They he you said that he didn't when he we moved to Copenhagen. He didn't stay in the palace, but pretty near. Except he didn't live with the family in the royal palace. He lived in a separate place. Yeah, yeah, or whatnot. Um, and and he, then he lived in in uh, in the center, close to the the uh, rich and and fancy center of Copenhagen. But I mean, back back then, probably everything was in the center, in a in, in a sense. Uh, not quite. Copenhagen yeah. was pretty big. Okay. Okay. One hundred thousand people in eighteen oh one. Okay. And, well, uh, but it was enclosed with tight borders. Uh, about how many people you say? I think one hundred thousand people. About one hundred thousand, and then that's interesting because when he went to Denmark, you 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 said about the the amount of the number of black or African descent people that lived in Copenhagen and what, what number would you say was was I think uh, one uh, historian legal scholar estimated 100 people about 100 yeah 
okay. from basically ex-slaves or current slaves from from the colonies okay or children of slaves and and at the time that he arrived in Copenhagen, they definitely practiced. Uh, they, the slavery was still going on in the in the not just. The, I'm talking about when he left the colony in in Copenhagen. In, yeah, yeah, he came to Copenhagen in 1794 or something, and and right. this female man uh, governor died a year after, so he was uh, the property of Frau Simmelmann. Right. And he spends 10 years in, in Copenhagen, and that's his uh, adolescence. He, he learns a lot of things and, right. and languages and, and music, I think. And he played the violin, correct? Yes, and played the yeah. violin. And, and right. then he, uh, he escapes after the court proceedings. Right. And that's the big, uh, you said it was like one of the biggest uh, court proceedings in European history. That you know of, uh, when uh, the, I guess the master died, uh, and the the general died, and then the 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 wife, the widow, was trying mm -hmm. to claim him, yeah. and things like that, and that's the court proceeding we're talking about. Um, the um, and then the verdict was handed down, and then what was the verdict on on that right there? They had. It was quite simply that it concluded that Hans Jonathan was born as a slave. Right. And uh, so therefore, because his mother was a slave. And, right. And as a result, he remained a slave. And, right. And that he was the property of, uh, of Simmerman, who had owned the mother in the beginning. Right. And, and so, hence so see, he was sentenced to, uh, well, the court concluded that uh, Frau Simmerman would have to sort of claim her property to actually uh, arrest him or, or bring him to her household mm, 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 mm. Uh, in order to to maintain her property and, and and then she would be able to sell him back to uh, to St. Croix or the St. Croix which might be profitable because people anticipated that the legal framework on slavery would be collapsing soon and right. and, and the and the persons who were property in uh, 1802 might be useless financially in in, uh, in a couple of years. All right. And then we, we skip right past, I, I forgot, and right before that, he was in 1801, the Battle of Copenhagen, yeah. he was he was in, and, and, and you say that he actually was pretty heroic in, 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 that, in that war there. Yeah, he, uh, he offered it, to, to uh, play a role and take part. Right. And, and there was lots of people who died and, and, uh, and, and the skipper on, on, of the vessel on which he fought uh, gave him uh, a good uh, recommendation afterwards and, and said, uh, this guy should be freed and, right. and, and influenced the crown prince of Denmark to sign a letter to, to that effect. And I, and, and you, I believe that it, that really influenced him to serve. You know, I, I used to be in the military to serve time in the, the military at, at those times to fight for your life, you know, for yeah. for the crown or whatever, and then still remain, you know, a slave. So I know that was a, a, a big thing for him. And so then after the verdict, he decides to still himself away on a, a frigate or on a boat, you said, yeah. on one yeah. of the one of the last ones that were that was leaving. Um, Copenhagen before winter time came or whatnot. Yeah. And then ever since then they've they had they haven't heard of him for what about over two hundred years? Yeah. Until you pull pull this information out or no, um, it's, it's a long part? story. It's a long story. It's uh, uh, it was not my job to kind of discover the guy. It was right, right, right. Danish historians and writers finally connected. I mean, it was quite interesting. The, the discourse was kind of on two tracks. Right. There, was an, there was a guy who was well known in Eastern Iceland in 18, uh, uh, two to 1827. Yeah. And uh, people knew he came from some distant land and, and they must have sensed that his skin was slightly darker than, than everybody else's. Mm. Uh, but uh, that's it. Then there was another discourse in, in uh, Denmark, in mm. Copenhagen, which uh, focused. No, of, of course, I know it wasn't like it was just a like, you know, moment like that. It was a development. 
Yeah. All all this was a development when on figuring out, you know, who this person was. But you was it you that kind of put that final stamp or kind of yeah, conclusive? in a sense. I pulled pulled the uh, stuff together. Right. What had been written and uh, I tried to fill in the empty slots. Right. Exactly when did you come to Iceland? Um, uh, and what happened to him there? Um, and and uh, there, Icelanders are, are quite uh, good at keeping documents. I mean, it's a Danish bureaucracy originally. So the, the, I, there's, there's amazing stuff in the archives. And I believe that because uh, it hadn't been explored, although the, some of the descendants had. Uh, pulled out some things, and 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 then there were people in Denmark pulling out some things from the Royal Archive in Copenhagen, but this stuff hadn't been combined until mm. a, a Danish uh, writer historian, Alex Frank Larsen, mm. who used the documentary I saw in Copenhagen, and which sparked my interest uh, overnight, and he uh, he connected the. Or one of the people in, in, in Copenhagen who connected the two stories. And, and part of it was that the Icelandic descendants were celebrating their, their ancestry in year 2000, I think. Right. So there was a big gathering in Eastern Iceland. Right. Dozens, if not hundreds, of people. And, and, uh, uh, and for the purpose of celebrating their ancestry, they 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 started to to draw the strings together. Mm. Still, the, the story was only half told, although mm. the two discourses had finally been combined and, and people realized the Hans Jonathan in the Icelandic narrative was the same one as the court documents in Copenhagen spoke about. So um, I, I, I built on all of that and trying to add some some stuff and, and to write a, a narrative which was uh, readable and interesting and, and relevant for the current time of. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And that's what I was about to get into because we got about five more minutes before you leave. Mm -hmm. uh, you in, the, in this book, in the English version, because uh, uh, you add the descendants, uh, things about the descendants, then, then we'll get into the lessons of history, but the descendants. Uh, the Jonathan family, the the Eric's, the Eirikssons, uh, mm -hmm. family of New England, uh, meaning around the, yeah. the eastern seaboard, yeah, right, that are connected, um, and then you get into uh, the lessons of history, which I, I when I when I remember reading the back, I was like, and he even have uh, you even got uh, Black Lives Matter in there, mm -hmm. and and things like that, how you try to draw on lessons uh, for today when it comes with racism, mm -hmm. uh, the dismantling of racism and why do people become racist and, and things like that. You even have some, you talk a little, you, you, uh, a little excerpt from uh, Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates in there and things mm -hmm. like that. So I was like, I was thinking that, that couldn't have been in 2014 when this first was public, uh, published in Icelandic and it just got translated into English so I figured you had to have added um, during that time period when it got, mm -hmm. yeah. And then when I heard one of your other interviews, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard you say that. Why, why do you feel that it's, uh, I already know because it's racism is relevant, but you know, um, why did you feel like you needed to add the, the yeah. last part there, which I really appreciate and I really do like the lessons of history and the, the end of the chapter and also the timelines of, yeah. Yeah, th thank you for the comments. And uh, I touched the issue in the Icelandic edition. Uh, but as you say, it was a slightly different time. I mean, Bla the Black Lives Matter wasn't there. Right. And, uh, and I was writing uh, a, a story for an Icelandic uh, public market, a trade book, which would appeal to the public and not to the specialists. And, uh, and then uh, I had it uh, uh, translated into English, uh, and uh, I had an excellent uh, American editor, a friend, uh, uh, 
Nancy Mary Brown in, in Vermont. And uh, I'm telling, I'm telling. When it was announced to be translated into English, I was waiting. I was counting. I was like in October because I remember it's October, and uh, yeah. And I was like, oh my, I can't wait to this thing. You know, I was like, I didn't know what I was gonna. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you you waited. Right. And, right. right. Uh, so. Uh, after you're done, I want to get into two quick things. I didn't mean to interrupt you because I know I'm looking at the time and I know when you have to yes. go. So after you're done with that, I was going to get into two quick things. Yeah, just briefly. And then I managed to sell the manuscript to the University of Chicago Press. Mm. And then had three or four uh, external reviewers who read the manuscript right. and, and wrote an extremely useful report mm. and urging me to dive even more fully into uh, modern concerns, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, and American uh, racism. I had added the story of the Ericsons because uh, I came across it and it was so relevant for the American scene. Right. But, but I also had to make sense of, of the North American context more specifically right, right. because of them and because of the world. I mean, Black right. Lives Matter has really Absolutely. made headlines everywhere. So, Absolutely. And, and I'm glad I did that. And, and, Absolutely. When you came off, I was like, wow, this, I was like, I wasn't expecting that at the end of it. And I was, that was a good, good thing that I, I really appreciated it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, quickly, um, the, the recon, uh, the recon, well, you said that, you know, as far as uh, the, the, the Hans Jonathan story is very important because that's kind of some of the origins of racism uh, in Iceland and maybe in, in some ways in Europe, where kind of around that time where it introduced racism, as far as we know it. Um, as you know, on my YouTube channel, I, I actually interviewed a guy, uh, Benjamin Isaac, uh, Tel Aviv uh, mm -hmm. University professor, who talks about the origin in, in in, in antic, antic, I can't even say it, antiquity in the I know fifth the guy. I, huh? know the guy. I know, you know the him. Guy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know you interviewed him. Yeah, check it out. Yes, <laughs> uh, major, you... major book on the subject. And... Yeah, major book. And I, yeah, I, I have it too. And so he's on my YouTube channel. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, um, I, he was the two, two interviews ago. I interviewed yeah. him in Tel Aviv, well, by Zoom, yeah. Tel Aviv University. And he, he, he dates it to 5th century BC. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, he, although you see me, you're on my, you linked him on Facebook. You see me uh, post a lot of silly memes every now and then. But I really do. I'm really into history. So, so now you know. Um, but, yeah. But uh, you, you said far as uh, in modern context, of course, racism was, mm -hmm. was introduced into Iceland. Uh, the, the racial makeup, that's what I was going to get into. So, the racial makeup in Iceland. Well, now, what's what's kind of the racial makeup in Iceland? There weren't, there's, there's still not too many um, compared to Norway. You used to live in, actually, used to live in Norway. Um, yeah. You were a professor in Norway, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. See that we, if we had more time, I would have gotten into those things from the beginning. But I knew we had a short time, so I just kind of wanted to. Do. But um, Norway is Norway is more mixed, but Iceland basically, is, right? Is, it's getting quite mixed as well. I mean, more and more. Substantial proportion of Icelanders is is uh, uh, Polish and from right. different parts of the world, and increasingly. Right. Used. Although they're white, I heard you say Polish too, but they're white. So yeah, true. So, but but far as people of color is what we're yeah. trying to yes. is is uh, not too many in Iceland still. Uh, not too many, no. Right, 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 right. Got not you. More. But yeah. it's coming, and, and it's quite yeah. visible, and, and they are active and, and visible and, and, uh, yeah. and uh, respected, etc. Got you. And it, the thing was with, with Hans Jonathan. I he mean, was the first. He can, he's the first. Written, he, known. Yeah. Then it's all white or right. Irish or Norwegian background, basically. Right. I'm sure there must have been some mixing in, in uh, history, which we don't know of. Correct, correct. But correct. Uh, nobody w who could uh, properly be applied the label uh, black or colored, uh, mm. as far as we know. Right. So when he comes, when Hans Jonathan comes, uh, uh, Icelanders are not bothered by skin color. That was my point I was trying to get to. Yeah. Correct. And Danish historians have demonstrated how racism arrived in Denmark with the super trade. That's mm. it. Mm. Prior to that, mm. 
black people would be uh, hardly been noticed in the streets. Right. Categorized and, and, and ridiculed, etc. Right, right. And, but during the uh, court def case, def def course. Definitely in the modern context, as we said. And like I said, when we spoke about Benjamin, he's like, he's talking about proto-racism proto when yeah, they're talking about it's, it's that environmental heavy, thing and stuff like yeah, that. But, it's a heavy debate to, right, right. Sort of to ask. But you're correct. I agree with you when it comes to the modern context of how we see racism. Yeah. That, it's yeah. the tricky issue, whether you're speaking about the same kinds of racism during the time that Isaac right. is talking about right. and, and the racism we're talking about in Copenhagen right. in, say, 1801. Right. But right, the thing right. is that in 1802, during the heat of the court case, Denmark right. is already thoroughly racist because of the sugar trade and, and the uh, slave oh. trade. And Iceland is not because it's a, it's a marginal community out there and no black person in sight. So people have So how can you? Right, what you don't know, correct. Yeah. But half a century later, it comes like a, an avalanche to Iceland. Right. right. And for reasons which I explained in the book. Absolutely. Then the descendants of Hans Jonathan experience the stigma and, and struggle mm, with racism. Mm, mm. And, you, and, and the last thing, the, the very interesting, in 2018, the Nature Journal, um, you said you had some friends or colleagues that uh, reconstructed the genome uh, of the 18th century Hans Jonathan. Oh. Reverse engineering without any physical remains. I, I found that amazing. Mm. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, and so that's how they were able to retrace. Uh, I don't know how they did it, but without physical remains. But, you know, modern science is very, very, very yeah. good. And they, they figured it out. They reconstructed the genome uh, and, and reverse engineered it. So they were able to find, uh, right, the a lot of the. the descendants yeah and link them to to the yeah uh, because and you can probably explain it better than i can yeah. because of the genetic uh, uh company deco genetics uh, we know okay. a lot about the the variation in the icelandic genome right and we know almost exactly when when african signatures arrived not the sort of uh, prehistoric one. I mean, we're right, from right. Africa, but the in, in 1802, there was a mixing, or soon after that, when Hans Jonathan married and had kids, there was a right. mixing, and a mixing, and that mixing is visible in in the genome in the data mm. of depot genetics. Mm. So that's how they started, and 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 they have. Uh, assembled uh, genetic information from these people with the African so-called signatures right. and then uh, uh, lining up uh, a substantial uh, proportion of, of the genome of Hans Jonathan. And, and, uh, and this was a stunning feat. This hadn't been done before. So it's kind of... Uh, and they were able to find thousands of... Uh, or at over a thousand uh, descendants in Iceland? They knew the descendants, that's it. Yeah. But they would assemble signatures from the genomes right. in order to lay out uh, the genome right. and, and uh, uh, to reconstruct his genome without having his bones or tissue or anything. Right, right. That was right. the revolution. Right. And, and, and secondly, they, they were able to. Uh, Having that information, they were able to ultimately genomes from uh, Africa, and assuming nothing, they could see that the most likely like origins candidates okay. of Emilia Regina's origin were were West African, which uh, resonates with the with Ghana, the vessels, and how they traded yeah. slaves. Then they come down to two places: Ghana and somewhere. Uh, not Ghana. It was uh, no, no. Okay. Actually, I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's not. The, not the, so. the national boundaries have changed. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Well, Arde, is there anything that you're working on that you can talk about uh, now? Any any new works that you... I'm not talking about that project, but uh, <laughs> any uh, scholarly work uh, that you are a part of mm -hmm. that you can talk about uh, that's kind of related to race or... Ecology or geology uh, or something? 
And you're not doing you're not doing those volcanoes, are you anymore? No, not really. Okay. That, that was a side issue, kind of. Okay. But uh, the the uh, what do you call it? The not the maturation. You call it the uh, hold on, I got it. Domestication of yeah. volcanoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Because the, there's 13 volcanic uh, volcano yeah. systems. I mean, everything is volcanic in Iceland, so you're right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been, but I want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But. Uh, so anything that you can talk about? Any? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, yeah. I, for the last uh, three or four years, I've been deeply into the issue of extinction, which is part mm. of it. I mean, birds and, and uh, all kinds of species are, are falling down and, and uh, it's exponential and it's part of the... Some might say it's 5G. Sorry? Some, some might say it's 5G. The 5G network. That's why birds are falling down and stuff. Uh -huh. that, I'm just joking. Go ahead. <laughs> right, and, but uh, I've written a book on on the fate of one species, which probably became extinct well, in, Iceland in 1844, the uh, great auk, and uh, and I'm hoping that that book will be published in in uh, in English uh, next year. It okay. uh, traces the uh, falling of, of this uh, historic species. Mm. Great dog. It couldn't fly and, and it was hunted in the North Atlantic in many places. And, and that's been my passion in, for the last three years. So. Nice, nice, nice. Well, people, we ran a little bit over time. I thank you very much, Gisli Paulson. And till next time, uh, till next work. Uh, and you'll see me on Facebook. I'll see you on Facebook yes. as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank Have you. a good one. Be safe. Thank, thank you, right. Robert, for the right. interview and, and for right. sharing interest in this stuff. And take thank care. You. And thank you for the opportunity as well. And check out check out that, uh, the Benjamin Isaac one, though.